Lost in the pleasures, try to rise there to capture. Though we didn't give in to their cries. Just pilgrims and strangers and unholy dangers. The things that this world would entice. Bedlams and fools accuse their wisdom. Tuesday night, we were uh, at our home and our family were, like many of us, glued to our television screens trying to see what was going to happen around us. And so Cody and I thought it would be a a great idea for us to uh, drive out to Tampa and and buy some fireworks and bring them over and and invite any who would want to show up to come over to our place and enjoy uh, some chili and some fireworks and whatever insanity was going to happen uh, on that night. And what, uh, what we weren't expecting was that we were going to uh, be in great fear and turmoil during it. Not because of what we were seeing on the television screen, but because of the fireworks that we had purchased. There were these one fireworks that looked really cool, super cheap, like 50 cents. And you, you light them and they start spinning. And they fly up into the air and then they have this cool little explosion. And it's pretty neat. But the thing is, is you had no clue where this was going to go. You had no idea where the, and I guess that's part of the fun. And Matt and I were standing over in the corner uh, by a blow-up Christmas tree that I'm sure was very flammable. And uh, all of a sudden, one of those were lit. And then, like a rocket that had a beacon aimed at us, I think Matt or I had the red dot on as it comes flying at us. And of course, I then start to panic, and I do the first thing that seems sensible to me. I grab the chair in front of me, and I run. I don't know what Matt is doing. I'm thankful he's still here, so it looks like he was okay. Uh, I don't know what happened there. It was every man for himself at that point. I'm not sure why I grabbed the chair. It didn't make sense to grab the chair. Maybe if Matt would have lit on fire or something, I would have a front row seat. I don't know. I'm sorry, Matt. I feel horrible that I completely abandoned you in your time of need. But I just ran from it. It's like at that moment, my life flashed before my eyes. I was like, this is it. I was going to die by a 50-cent firework that was coming at me. I I didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew I had to get out of there. And so at that moment... Uh, as funny as it was, and it wasn't as dangerous as I probably made it out to be. Maybe it was. You'll have to get Matt's side of the story uh, afterwards. But it was a scary moment. Uh, But many of us, whether they're in, in good joy or not, have had scary moments in our lives. Many of us would probably be able to share different stories about where maybe your life literally flashed before your eyes. Uh, I remember two of those instances in my life. One of them was when I was 13 years old, and me and a buddy of mine were on tubes on a lake in Polk City, and we were in a a heated battle. Who can knock the other person off the tube? And so what we were doing is we were battling off while the boat was going 30 miles an hour and flinging us all over the lake, who was going to be the winner of the tubes? Well, this did not go well for me, as I'm sure you're about to find out. I leaped over to the other tube. I grabbed hold of him as he kicks me in the chest. It was horrible. Flings me back over to my other tube. I fall off the tube. I grab the handle as I'm about to fall off because I will not lose this. A 13-year-old has to have pride in their life. I was not going to lose this. And now I am like barefoot skiing except on my chest with the rest of my body dangling out. But I was not going to let go of this tube. 
However, as I was doing that, water was splashing into my throat as I was trying to yell and scream and say what a punk this kid was. But it finally got to the point where I couldn't hold on any longer because I was choking. What was happening, I was literally drowning while I was hanging on to that and not wanting to get off. I finally let go, and I had a life vest on, and I could see the, the tube and the boat go out, but what was happening is I could not catch my breath. I could not get the water that was in my lungs out. And for that moment, I thought, this is it. I'm, I'm going to die in this moment, and nobody knows that I'm, I'm in this state. Thankfully, by the grace of God, I was able to cough it out, and I was able to continue breathing. And then I continued by winning and getting him off his tube. But that's the, that's the next part of the story. Uh, but there was another time where I was driving down I-4, and if you didn't know, I-4 is actually the most dangerous stretch of road in the entire country. And this was before there were guardrails in the middle, and I was heading to work into Lakeland from Polk County, and a semi was decided it was going to come over into the fast lane. And I was in the middle, so I couldn't slow down, I couldn't speed up, and the only thing I could do was either try to hit it with my little Ford Ranger, and that wasn't going to go well, or go off the side of the road. And I went off the side of the road, and all of a sudden, when my wheels hit the grass, I start sliding. And so I keep sliding over because there was no median, and I get closer and closer to the other road on the other side, and I see the oncoming traffic going. I panic, and I slam my wheel to the other side, and as soon as my tire hits on the road, it flings me back to the other side. And I'm trying to apply the brake, but in the grass, it wasn't working. And so I'm flying to the other side of the road. I fling my wheel back to the other side. As soon as the wheels get up on the right side of the road that I was on, it flings me back again. And I just couldn't stop until finally both of my tires on the right side of the vehicle blow. And I get flipped up on the side. But luckily, I then come back down, and I survived it. It was, it was interesting because not one person stopped in that whole situation. And I remember just standing there shaking for a good 20 or 30 minutes, realizing that that could have been it. At that moment, my life could have ended. Though I'm here today, and apparently you are too, so this is good, Solomon is wanting us to take a look at our mortality. He's wanting us to take a look at what it looks like to understand life and death. And we've journeyed with Solomon over the past seven weeks as he's taken us on this adventure called life. He's taken us through this adventure as if he was a tour guide taking us through, say, the Grand Canyon or Yellowstone or Gettysburg. And he's showing us all the different things that are happening on a life lived under the sun, a life that we can all see and experience. And what he is showing us is that a life lived apart from God is ultimately meaningless. A life lived apart from God is ultimately pointless. It's like a chasing after the wind. It's like a grasping at vapor. You can't do it. The Hebrew word is, who remembers it? Oh, I got to do better. Hevel. It's Hevel. And so the Hebrew word is saying, look, all of this is meaningless. All of it is pointless. All of it does not lead to anything apart from God. But in God, we have meaning. We have purpose. We have a, a reason to live. And so he's making the case and helping us look at money and time and politics and possessions and even religion and helping us see how the world looks at these things. And then he reminds us, apart from God, life is actually cruel. Apart from God, life is evil and it's meaningless. And so pondering and meditating on these things, it's a good thing for us to do. You see, we were born into sin, and we were born into rebellion against God. And we were acting as if God doesn't exist, or worse, that we were our own God. And see, this is the state that all of us find ourselves in at one point or another. And then when God rescues us, the reality is we're still in that same mindset. Now, God gives us a new heart, a new mind, a new eyes to see, new ears to hear. We are no longer shackled to the sins that once controlled our life, but we've been set free from those shackles. However, even though we've been set free from those shackles, we've still lived a life that has been separated from God. And though we no longer have to follow the life of sin, we're constantly fighting that battle, taking off the things of our old self and putting on the new reality of who we are in Christ. Therefore, Ecclesiastes is a great way for us to test ourselves. I mean, this can be a very depressing book. 
I mean, even it said something beautiful. It's like, enjoy the love of your wife in all of this vain life. It's like, whoa, what, what are you, what? Uh, we were getting sentimental for a moment. And it's like, no, but this is important for us. Because what Solomon is doing, he's trying to make us look at all the things that the world has to offer. And are we putting our faith, hope, and trust in those? Are we making the things of this world our God? <clears throat> or are we making God the true king of our lives? And Solomon is now turning to that which is only whispered and, and hushed voices around the corner. Or the topic that as soon as we think about, we quickly want to take that out of our mind. Because it's not comfortable. We all know that death will come to us all, yet we avoid its reality as long as we can. We get shocked when it stares us in the face because we ultimately don't want that to come. And then if we're given a few months left to live, we don't know what to do with ourselves oftentimes. But let's see how Solomon is going to handle this topic today and how it points us to Christ. So if you have your Bibles with you or turn them on if that's your preference, we're going to be in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, if you have your Bible and you open it to the middle, you'll see Psalms and Proverbs and you'll see Ecclesiastes. And so we'd like to have you join us. We're going to be in chapter 9. We're going to be in verses 1 through 10. We're going to be reading out of the English Standard Version. So Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 1. These are the words of the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit written through the human author of Solomon says this. But all of this I laid to heart examining it all. And so Solomon begins with these words saying, all of these things that I have shared with you up until this point, everything, I have examined it all. Solomon's not telling us something that he just came up with last week while he was just sitting at the dining room table. No, Solomon is saying, look, these things that I'm telling you are based off a life lived to the fullest. And it's based off of me actually thinking on, examining, and laying it up in my heart to know whether this was going to be true. And so what does he see? Well, it's not death, at least not yet. Look at what he ponders. He ponders this, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Listen to this. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It is the same for all. So Solomon's argument begins as he sets up what he's going to talk about. He looks at it and says, look, the righteous and the wise, these are like good people. These are good things. The righteous and the, wi the wise and their actions. But he's, let's see what he says about it, if it has any meaning. Solomon begins his examination by trying to figure out if God is truly against us using only what he can see under the sun. Now, let me explain this because it can get a little confusing. What Solomon is saying here, he's saying, under the sun, using only my eyes that I can see in my experiences, only the natural, not the supernatural, only this, I look out and I see wise people. I see righteous people. But when it comes to the topic, is there any difference? Does it really matter? Well, let's, let's look. The verse continues. Since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, hear this, the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice, as the good one is, get this, so is the sinner. And he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. See, if we look at death from this standpoint, we see that it doesn't matter who we are, what we do, who we know, what we've accomplished, what we haven't accomplished. It all ends the same. Solomon is recognizing and saying this is a great evil that you can do all of this good stuff. You can lay down your life. You can go ahead and give all of this. You can do all this. You can be all this. And it doesn't matter because you're going to end up in the same situation of death just like the person who has done nothing but evil and selfishness their whole life. And Solomon's wrestling with this from the natural way from just seeing what he sees. But there is something that Solomon did not experience in his lifetime. 
Though he experienced much, he didn't experience this. And that is the arrival of the anticipated Savior. You see, during this time in the Old Testament, Solomon was anticipating the arrival. The entire Old Testament, as I've said before, is summed up in one word, and that is anticipation. Anticipation for the one that would come and set all things right. Anticipation to the one who would rescue, who would ransom, who would redeem and restore. There was anticipation. And we have that information today, but Solomon was looking forward to it. So Solomon is saying, based on what I can see, based on what is not yet here, this is what I have to go on. But we now have Jesus, so we look through those lens. But let's keep going. Because of this, death for a believer is a curse. But because of Jesus, death to the believer is also a blessing. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever taken a moment and just stopped for a few minutes and think about death being a blessing? I mean, most of the times we don't think of it that way. We're trying so hard to avoid it. We're, we're putting on face creams and, and dyeing our hair and exercising because we want to avoid this. But it doesn't matter how much you eat or drink, how much you exercise, no matter what kind of uh, tummy tucks or facelifts that you do, it's going to come to us all. But we know it's a curse because this isn't what humanity was called to when created. We were called to walk with God. We were called to enjoy God, to worship God, and to follow God. Yet if you've opened your Bible to the very first book of Genesis, we see that Adam and Eve decided they wanted to seize autonomy for themselves. They wanted to be their own God, or as it says, like God. They wanted to know the difference between good and evil. They didn't trust in God, but they also wanted to know what that was like. They were like every one of us at one point. Because we've all been there. We've all done that. We've all rebelled against God. We've all tried to go our own ways. And like everyone else, at one point, we were deceived. The disease of sin wouldn't be defeated, though. Not in the way we would think. The disease of sin that has then gone through each and every one of us. There's no vaccines that we can get for this. There's actually no face mask that you wear for this. Actually, the only thing that will help in this case is blood. And it's the blood of ourselves from also dying because of the curse of sin. But we would also be redeemed by the blood of another. By the blood of Jesus. That's why Jesus is so important to us. That's why Christ is king. That's why we put our lives and our hope all in this basket because of Christ. Let's look how we see this. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says this. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and as we know today, death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. However, listen to this, for the believer who follows Jesus, death is a blessing. Now, how is that so? It would be actually awful if we lived forever in this fallen and broken world. It'd be awful if this was all we had to look forward to was more pain, more sickness, more uh, detrimental aspects of our body falling apart and breaking and withering, withering due to this curse. I mean, we would basically, after some point, become the walking dead. We would be like a zombie walking through this earth because we see everything failing within us. Our beauty fades. Our, our energy fades. Our body fades. Everything fades. Do we want to live forever like this? No. No, we don't. For the unbeliever, though, this is a curse. Because they, they have no hope and they must. For the atheist, for the agnostic, they better live and do everything they can and avoid death as long as they can because in their mind, once it's over, it's over. But to the believer, we have great hope. Now, obviously, we don't want to die. It scares us. But we have great hope as a believer. Let me ask you, do you think that way? Have you wrestled with this or have you tried to avoid it? Have you taken the time to think about and, and rest in what death means, because it's a topic we don't want to talk about. So death is a blessing that we will one day be back to walking with God again, like the garden, but only better. Let's look at Revelation chapter 21. You got verses 3 and 4 here. And it says, And I heard in a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Amen. 
He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Let's look at the next slide. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning. This is where we get excited, people. Death will be no more. No mourning, no crying, no pain anymore for the former things have what? Have passed away. Amen. This is the hope for the believer. Death, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? It has none over us if you're a believer in Christ. This is where we are. But why is the garden better? Or sorry, why is this reality better than the garden? Because the garden was not eternal. Better because the garden was not expansive. Better because now it won't just be Adam and Eve. It'll be you and me. We will get to be in this new heaven and new earth with Lord, our Lord and Savior, walking with God as Adam and Eve once did, without the deception of sin, without the fallenness and brokenness. Like, we will be able to be in unity despite what our favorite baseball teams are and despite whatever candidate we follow. We will be in complete unity. This is amazing. Now, we and Solomon does, for that matter, Know that there is that that is beyond the natural. Because remember, Solomon's looking at the natural here. We know there's something beyond that that we can see and experience. But reality for us today is that we are still here. We are still alive. We have not yet met the end of our time on earth. Let's look at verse 4. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. Not, not super encouraging, is that? But still the point that is encouraging is still there. While you are alive, hear me church, while you are alive, you still have meaning and purpose. You still have a task. You still have a calling. There's still something for you to participate in and do. But once you die, everything that you've been working towards, trying to accomplish, everything is now done. It's over. Your time is up. Now we know there is hope and future with Christ. Yes, but our time to do what we were called to do while living on this earth has ended. And we will stand judgment for how we managed ourselves while we were on this earth. Everything good about us and everything bad about us will die. We all will die. We will be mourned today and tomorrow forgotten. If this is our lot, then what do we do? Solomon gives us the answers next. Hear this. Verse 7. Go eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. Let not oil be lacking from your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. I don't know why I love that verse. <laughs> all the days of your vain life. Just enjoy it. <laughs> that he has given you under the sun because this is your portion in life and your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol. To which you are going. Sheol is the, the grave. It's the, also known as the place of the dead. Again, Solomon is speaking of this form from the standpoint of human knowledge. So he's looking at it from the natural, from a human knowledge standpoint. The New Testament gives us more understanding that upon death we enter into the part of Sheol known as heaven. And to be part, apart from the body is to be present with Christ. We see this in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, points us in this direction. But let's keep moving forward. We are told to enjoy our life. We're, in told, we're told to enjoy food. We're in told to enjoy wine. Enjoy our labor. Because a day is coming when we will not be able to contribute to God's plan on earth. God approves of us enjoying his creation and his gifts. Surprisingly, wine is mentioned as one of those things. But the Bible also mentions not to get drunk, so don't get too excited on me now. So we are to enjoy God's creation. We're to enjoy what, what Solomon is showing us to enjoy because these are gifts from God. Now Solomon's being very general in his application here. 
He says to enjoy this life for what it is. And this is true. And this is what we should do. But listen, Jesus takes us even a bit further. Jesus reminds us in the book of John, the gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 4. He says these words. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. So yes, we are to enjoy God's creation, enjoy his goodness, we are to enjoy his providence, but we must also be, be found doing the works of the Father who has given us things to do to accomplish it. Let's actually look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We may remember this one because we just finished up Ephesians. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which, get this, God has prepared before him that we should walk in them. We have been given a call. We have been given a command. We are not told that if you'd like to and you have nothing else going on this weekend, why don't you just follow God? No, it's, it's actually not that at all. We were told and given a proclamation, a mandate on what we are to be doing in this vain life for all the days that we have on this earth. We were told what we are to get to do. We were created in Christ Jesus, as I've said all the time, ransom, rescued, redeemed, restored, in order to do the good works that God has called us to do. We're all going to die. So while we are here, we enjoy what God has created, and we be about God's purpose and his mission that you have been invited to participate in. But guess what? This is for our joy and God's glory. You see, there's something, there's something cool and amazing about this. It's not just a vain life. There's something incredible because it's for our joy and for God's glory. You were not created for the purpose of starting your own business or working for someone else or homeschooling or whatever you're currently doing. You were not created for that. Let me explain that, though. You were created to glorify God and to advance his kingdom. But can you do that through your own job? Yes. Yes, you can. Can you glorify God through homeschooling your family? Yes, you can. Can you do that for working for someone else? Yes, you can. So the purpose isn't that you were created to do that. The purpose you were created to glorify God and the means with which we do that can be through the earthly possessions of work and, and schooling and teaching. But you were not created to advance someone else's kingdom. You were not created to advance your kingdom because once you die, you're now useless to this endeavor. You were created to advance the eternal mission and the eternal purpose. You were created for much more than this fallen and broken world that we live in under the sun. And that should give us great hope. Like, you have reason. You have meaning. And it's not fake meaning. It's not fake reason. You see all these commercials and all these advertisements trying to give you this false hope that you are beautiful and wonderful and you can be everything you want to be. And we find out as we pursue these things in our own flesh and our own desires, we find ourselves looking at it and falling short and it doesn't sustain us. But you are created for a purpose because God has knit you in the womb, has called you by name, and has given you marching orders for what you're supposed to do while you're on this earth so your life has meaning. You wake up this morning with meaning. You arrive here with meaning and you'll go home here with meaning. Every single day there is a purpose that you are called to participate in. But are you participating in it? Are you being sidetracked or are you participating in what God has called you to? So here's my great concern. It's distractions that take us away from the main point of life. And boy, are we so easily distracted. We are so easily distracted. It's like if you've seen the Pixar movie Up, Doug, every time he sees a squirrel, goes, squirrel! And he's like, as soon as anything happens, he's distracted and, and taken off the course. And guess what? All of us are prone to be just like Doug and get easily distracted by other things. It's so easy for us to be distracted by the cares of this world because we forget. We set reminders up to pick our kids up from school so that we don't we forget. We have meetings and calendars so that we don't forget. We do all of these things so that we don't forget. Guys apparently are horrible at this. We forget anniversaries. This does not go well for us. 
We forget birthdays. I have seven kids. We are awful at birthdays. Normally our kids, and Caden can amen this, and Lainey does, is usually birthdays last for three or four days because first of all, we've got to discover that there was a birthday that just happened. Then we've got to take a day to figure out how we're going to plan for the birthday. Then we do gifts, and then we may go do something. So they just know that it's like a birthday week more than a birthday day because we can never get this right, and we're awful at it. But hopefully they forgive us and everything will be okay. But what we've got to be careful of is we've got to remember that we are called to advance God's kingdom, not our own kingdom. And we forget that. So there's a, a great burden that I've been under recently. I don't know if you follow me on Facebook or we've had a couple of conversations uh, face to face, but I've just had a great burden recently. I'm incredibly concerned, like I know many of you are. I'm incredibly concerned about the state of our country right now. You see what's happening and all the division that's happening. You see great divide. I'm concerned about the state of our neighbors and the the type of talk I'm hearing about how people are treating each other. Even Christians, how they're treating each other. It's, it's, It's awful that I'm seeing. I'm incredibly concerned for the church and how it's being turned into a business and an entertainment venue that promotes what looks more like paganism than what looks like Christianity. Like, I'm legitimately concerned about this, where God's word is being exchanged for self-help tips and how to live a better life. This is not Christianity. That's not what it is. We've moved into the gospel of self-help and self-love, where we are God and we're the ones that we worship. This isn't Christianity. We worship convenience and praise selfishness. We sing songs about how many cars and girls and chains we can have on our necks. It's like this is what matters to us. It's those claiming to be Christians that seem to be able to rattle off the latest Nintendo releases but can't memorize the five points of the gospel. This is a problem. This is a huge problem. We've forgotten what it means to have Christ. Our joy in Christ isn't there because we don't understand who Christ is. We don't understand what Christ has done. We're going to die wasting our life sitting on the bench when the coach has called us to be a starter on the field. We can't do this. Christian, hear me this morning. Your days are numbered. Yesterday is gone. You're not going to get it back. Let me share something that's, that's pretty wild and crazy, something that's taken from the Gospel of Luke. This may be shocking to you if you haven't read it before. And maybe you haven't looked at it this way. Chapter 9, verses 59 through 62. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at home. What did Jesus say? No one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Once someone dies, it's over. Yet you are still alive. You have been given a mission. You have been called. If you are sitting in this room this morning, which you are, then you have still been called. What is your excuse today for not following that call? What are you waiting to be What are you wanting to be? What do you think you're supposed to be? We are created in the image of God, rescued and redeemed and restored so that we have a purpose and what we're to call after. If you're a parent or even a grandparent, are you teaching your kids about Christ? Like, is that a priority to you? Kids and grandparents and sisters and brothers, is teaching your family Christ a priority to you? Are you more interested in teaching them about baby Yoda than baby Jesus? And that sounds funny and silly. Don't get me wrong. It's it's meant to be kind of silly, but it's meant to be true because our kids can rattle off so much about what's happening in Mandalorian, but can they rattle off the oracles and beauties of God? Like, can they? And is this important to you? Like, do you really care about this? My goal isn't to harm you or hurt you. My goal is to point you to Jesus who saves you. My goal is to rally the troops. My goal is to draw the line in the sand. My goal is to lock arm in arms with brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can be faithful. Will you stand? 
while you have breath in your lungs, are you going to lock arm in arms with the brothers and sisters in Christ around you for the purpose that God has called you to do? That's the church, people. That's what we're here to do. The church is not an option. The church is a mandate from God. Jesus died for the church. He died for the individuals so that we can be about the business of God. Church is not an option. It's a command from God. And that's what we are doing here. Here's an uncomfortable question to ask that I didn't think we would be asking so quickly. Are you willing to suffer for the cause of Christ? If not, why are you here? Like seriously, if you're not willing to suffer for the cause of Christ, go home. What are you expecting? Are you here for the donuts? Are you here for the coffee? Are you here for the kids ministry so you get a few minutes to relax and unwind without any distractions? Are you here for Rob's good looks? Maybe one person is. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But why are we here, people? Like, why are, why are we here? What is our purpose? What is our goal? What is the reason? What are we doing with the time that God has given us while we're on this earth? If you know anything about military, you've heard this term of basic training. And what is that? You go to basic training because what you got to do is you have to be equipped for what you're about to go through. So you go through grueling work, tireless days. You are putting your body to the very limits of what it can handle. And you are beaten down, yelled at, cursed at, hit, and just completely humiliated so that you can break down everything that you've had that would maybe prevent you from doing the task that you've been called to. And the reason why it's so painful and so hard is when you're on the front lines and the bullets are flying that you're not going to run back home to mommy or daddy, that you're going to stand and you're going to fight for your country and for the cause. And so you go through this grueling torture. Well, Christian, guess what? We have to take the part of ourselves that was once following this world, and we've got to take it off and rip it off, and we need to go through basic training so that we are prepared for what God has called us to do. If we're not, we're not going to last and as soon as hardships happen in our life, we're going to run. As soon as things happen that don't go our way or isn't fun, we're going to go back home. That's not what we are called to. That's not what being a Christian is about. Confessors of Christ's church is being prepared so that we will be ready. Until we receive the call, we're going to continue as a church to be trained and to be equipped. We must for not, not forget that one day we will die and everything we're working towards and trying to accomplish will be gone. We must not forget that. But let me share this side of it as well before we end. We're being called not only to prepare ourselves, but to stand firm and to declare the gospel and God's truth. But we're also called to be a light to our community. My call to unite and ready for battle is not a call for us to go to war with our community. I'm not saying that it's time for us, regardless of how the election pans out, if your candidate wins or doesn't win, that we're to go to war because what we know is right. No, listen to me, people. That's not our call for war. We're called to be a light to the community. We're called to show the love of Jesus to the community. We're called to help the community. We're called when people see us, they see Christ. They see the folly of their ways and they see the hope that there is in Christ. That is what we're called to project to the community. We're not called to go to battle. We're called to suffer. This goes against everything that we think and we want. We're called to get slapped around. We're called to get made fun of. We're called to, to stand when people are, are hurling insults at us and not give them back. This goes against everything within us. But this is what God's kingdom looks like. We're called to love our neighbors. We're called to be a light to the city. We're called to make beautiful what is destroyed. We're called to restore what is being broken. We're called not to fight the society that is fighting God. We're called to show them God. We're, show, we're here to call them to repentance and to trust in God for their conversion. What have you done for your neighbor recently? You could be missing out on a great witnessing opportunity. Why are you doing this? Why are you being so nice? Why are you mowing my yard? Why are you bringing over dinner? Well, because God has called me to be the light in a dark world, and I want to be a blessing to you. 
If you have a moment, I'd love to share with you what that's about. I mean, these are gospel opportunities that can happen by loving your neighbor and loving your friends and family well. Very soon, we are going to move into, as a church, the next step of our plan. And the next step of our plan as confessors in Christ is we're going to be the light in the darkness. Our next phase is right now we're equipping the saints for what we're called to do. We're going through Ecclesiastes to rip away all of the worldliness, to test all the things that we love and we hold on to, so that we have nothing less when we come through this gate except Christ. And then we take that out to there. We take that out into our community, into our neighbors, into our friends. But this only works and only makes sense if we have a right view of God, a right view of ourselves, a right understanding of God's purpose, and a right understanding of our call. We must be strong and we must be rooted in the gospel. We must not compromise the truth while doing it, but we point people to the truth and love for the good of them and the good of our community. God has placed you here today. Every one of you that are here, God has placed you here today to hear this message, to hear the book of Ecclesiastes, and to test ourselves. He's given us the opportunity to participate in bringing forth this kingdom and plan until one of two things happen. Either we die or he returns. That's it. We have a mandate and a call, and we're to do that until when? We die or he returns. But can't we retire from... From Christ after a while? No. No, you don't retire. There is no quitting. There is no clocking out. This is what we are called to do. And right now, for the time being, while we are still breathing, we are to do this. Death will come to all of us one day, but it is not here yet. So let us be about the Father's business until that comes, that day comes. Amen? Let's pray.